Yeah, this is uh, Penn Gillette, you know, the big guy at Penn and Teller from Las Vegas, Nevada. Sitting here with Michael Goudeau, uh, my uh, co-host and uh, and celebrated juggler of the Lance Burton Show. And uh, I, I, I am just about trembling. <laughs> I am about to pass out. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I believe I have never... Uh, been more nervous in an interview. We've been billboarding this interview for uh, months now, I think since we uh, started the show. Uh, I think we can say uh, that we have on the phone my biggest hero, yours too, Godot? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, the humiliating thing is that I uh, I just found out who he was like 10 years ago. Uh, I should have known uh, from the moment I was in grade school. They should have talked about him all the time and um, we should have uh, had to memorize everything he's done. I just read the book, uh, The Man Who Fed the World, by Leon Hesser, who's also on the phone. And you might want to call this number, 866-570-PEN, uh, that's 7366, 866-570-PEN, that's 7366, or uh, Gmail is penradio at penradio dot penradio.com. You might want to call before you have a question and make up the question as you go, because you're going to want to be able to say to your grandkids that you actually talk to this man. We have here no qualifications whatsoever, my biggest hero in the world, Dr. Norman Borlaug. Are you there? Are the phones working, doctor? Yes, sir. I'm here. It's, uh, and, and Leon, you also there? Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I think maybe I'll let you explain uh, <laughs> uh, why you should be uh, the biggest hero to everyone, uh, <laughs> Dr. Burlog. Uh, what, what did you have to do with the Green Revolution, and what did that mean to planet Earth? Well, the Green Revolution was the spreading high-yield technology, which uh, I and my team had been involved in developing spreading it to the developing countries of Asia, especially first to Pakistan and India, later to a number of other countries in Asia like Turkey, uh, Iran, uh, later to China, and also to Latin American countries. And how many... This included developing high-yielding varieties... Uh, that had the potential to produce high grain yields per acre, but at the same time it had to be coupled with good crop management, restoring soil fertility, controlling weeds and pests and so on, and then getting economic policies established by governments which permitted uh, the small farmer to adopt the technology. And how many people uh, do they estimate that you and your gang, uh, with this technology and the and the fertilizer and the government programs, how many lives do they estimate you save from starvation? Well, uh, there's no way of really measuring the numbers, but you see uh, numbers ca- cast around of several hundred millions of people. Uh, but this came on stream into. Uh, wide-scale production at a time when uh, hunger and starvation were uh, strong and uh, threatening and getting worse in India in the middle 60s and to Pakistan to a somewhat lesser extent. But it was probably even worse in China. But at that time, we didn't have access to Chinese information. Now, uh, what did it what did it feel like? It was 1970 that you won the Nobel Prize. Is that right? Right. And and what what did that feel like to win the Nobel? Did you did you have an inkling you were going to win it? No, of course not. No one had ever won a Nobel Prize for work in agriculture and food production. And the way the prize the Nobel prizes are structured, the only window to which someone working in food and agriculture should uh, could qualify was through the window of peace. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you won the Nobel Peace Prize for uh, feeding people. Yes. Okay. And now, now you have. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about the world, the World Food Prize, or do you want to talk about that, Leon? 
I want to I want to talk to Leon a little bit. We we called him. <laughs> How you doing, Leon? Oh, just fine, thank you. Uh, I loved I loved the book you wrote on Norman, which is called The Man Who Fed the World. And uh, you talk a lot about. I mean, uh, the last third of the book or so, you're talking an awful lot about the uh, the World Food Prize that kind of solves this uh, this gap in the in the in the Nobel Prize. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure. Yes. Uh, well, a few years after Norman won the Nobel Peace Prize, he went back to the uh, Nobel Committee and uh, said, you, you really should have a Nobel Food Prize. And they said, well, based on Alfred Nobel's will, we cannot do that. Uh, so Norman looked around and finally found a multimillionaire uh, who happened to be born in Iowa, the same uh, year that Norman was uh, born in Iowa, 19. That was a good year in Iowa for people, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. yes. That, was a, that was a bumper crop year for people in Iowa. <laughs> right. And uh, anyway, uh, they struck up a, a friendship, and uh, John Ruin uh, said, I will finance it. And uh, this year in October will be the 20th anniversary of the World Food Prize. And the the prize is given to the person or, in some cases, uh, two persons uh, in the world who have done the most to increase the uh, quantity or quality of food for poor people. Uh, I, I want to uh, ask one question kind of of both of you. Uh, I don't know the exact year, so please forgive me, and you'll probably be able to fill it in. But Paul Ehrlich uh, wrote the book, The Population Bomb, uh, the end of the 60s or very early 70s, right? Yes, and it, it was uh, about 1966 or 1967. Uh, in fact, there were two books written at that time, uh, which in effect said, let's give up on India. It's hopeless. Uh, we cannot, they cannot produce enough food, and we cannot provide them enough as gift. Uh, the United States had been providing uh, five or six million tons a year to try to keep them from starving. Uh, that was the sentiment when Norman Borlaug's technology was introduced in now, India and Pakistan. Now, now, Paul Ehrlich just wrote this book, The Population Bomb, and as far as I know, at least five or six years ago, it was still used as textbooks, and you'd still see it quoted often in like the New York Times and places. Uh, either one of you or both of you, could you help explain uh, any guess on why that book remains so popular and why it's so wrong? Well, first of all, uh, had not had there not been change in uh, agricultural productivity, that is, uh, yields of basic food per acre of cultivated land, the predictions that he made were true, because we were running out of the, the ability as had been the case all down through history. As more food was needed, more land was open to cultivation. But in many countries of the world, at the uh, beginning, right after World War II, there was no more land really suitable for agriculture that could be open to cultivation to increase pre